Welcome to Hip Hop History with the Hip Hop Doc. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, check him out on Facebook and Instagram. His new book, Son of the Ghetto, can be purchased on Amazon right now. Like, share, and hit that notification bell for more videos. Thank you for watching. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. And I want to I want to make the also the, the observation that the word plantation was the English system how they dealt with the Irish. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the English had a plantation system to exploit the labor of the Irish. It came to America it was called plantations. And when people in the 19th century heard the spirituals, they said they sound just like Irish hmm. folk songs. So it's important to understand that the root of Afro-American music and the root of all American music is Anglo-Celtic music. The harmonic roots and the, the folk songs, the use of the, of the sixth, and all the things that we're going to hear mm -hmm. in Motherless Childhood that, uh, that Jay Bad is going to play, that, that has its, as a matter of fact, St. James Infirmary, which is a, is a New Orleans song, was originally an Irish song. Right. You have been listening to Hip Hop History with the Hip Hop Doc. Don't forget to subscribe, grace, and peace. And when people in the 19th century heard the spirituals, they said they sound just like Irish hmm. folk songs. So it's important to understand that. When you read descriptions of this music and the body movements that accompany it, do you know that it's described as wild, savage, unintelligible? The unusual religious behavior of slaves at camp meetings in a work entitled Methodist Error or Friendly Advice to Those Methodists Who Indulge in Extravagant Religious Emotions and Bodily Exercises, 1819. John Watson complained about the style of musical behavior of black revivalists in the Philadelphia Conference. Here ought to be considered, too, a most exceptionable error, which has the tolerance at least of the rulers of our camp meetings. In the blacks' quarter, the colored people get together, and sing for hours together, short scraps of disjointed affirmations, pledges, or prayers, lengthened out with long repetitious choruses. These are all sung in the merry chorus manner of the Southern Harvest Field, or husking frolic method, of the slave blacks, and also very greatly like the Indian dances, 
with every word so sung, they have a sinking of one or other leg of the body alternately, producing an audible sound of the feet at every step, and as manifest as the steps of actual Negro dancing in Virginia and C. If some, in the meantime, sit, they strike the sounds alternately on each thigh. The evil is only occasionally condemned, and the example has already visibly affected the religious manners of some whites. From this cause, I have known in some camp meetings from fifty to sixty people crowd into one tent, after the public devotions had closed, and there continue the whole night, singing tune after tune, scarce one of which were in our hymn books. Some of these from their nature, having very long repetition choruses and short scraps of matter, are actually composed as sung and are almost endless. Dot, dot, dot. Besides shedding some light on the original religious songs of blacks as distinguished from the standard Protestant hymns that they sang, the account above is significant because it tends to support the argument that black patterns of behavior influence white revivalists at the camp meetings. Our music has always been free. We've been free to express it rhythmically, free to express it um, harm harmonically. That freedom was somehow taken away from us by missionaries who attempt to bring Christianity to us. And in bringing in the deliverance of Christianity, pulled out that which they considered to be unfit for our musical expression. The whole emotional aspect of the African uh, culture and religion was thought of as, quote, childish from the beginning. You understand what I mean? And, um, but they found out other things that altered that somewhat. For instance, why they took the drum away. They found out that the drum, you know, they weren't just beating on their wood, that they were actually... Uh, you know, uh, communicating with each other, and usually after they beat on that wood a little while, the way the term rap actually comes from, when they got through rapping on that wood, then all kinds of things would happen. You know, I mean, the, you know, the storehouse might burn up, the slaves would run off, somebody would get poisoned. So very quickly, they had to take that drum away from the slaves, which then made the slaves, all the music that they made is like percussive without the drum. Gradually, even as early as the 1800s, this enthusiasm begins to affect um, white congregation. A growing evil, the formidability of black form, the attribution of a particular social danger to the newly identified black vocal forms was famously put forward in Reverend John Fanning Watson's 1819 publication Methodist Error. Still keeping with the official evangelical orthodoxy of post-revolutionary Methodism, Watson directed his charge not at slave participation per se so much as at the irrefutable evidence of African-American musical influence. In the public performances of blacks at Methodist gatherings, and, in particular, at an event staged outside of Philadelphia in 1817, Watson identified a growing evil that had corrupted the practice of singing in our places of public and society worship. According to Watson, Black participants had brought to the revivals and open-air camp meetings by then common across the land a performance style and repertory, scarce one of which were in our hymn books, and accompanied by distinctive practices conjuring relations with the ring shout and African dance. What is more, this repertory was not only performed among white congregants but increasingly borrowed and sung by whites themselves. In the Blacks' Quarter, Watson observed in an off-sided comment, the colored people get together, and sing for hours together, short scraps of disjointed affirmations, pledges, or prayers. So very quickly, they had to take that drum away from the slaves, which then made the slaves, all the music that they made is like percussive without the drum.
gradually, even as early as the 1800s, this enthusiasm begins to affect um, white congregations. As a matter of fact, in the uh, 1800 revival, we began to see an exchange of singing between the slaves and the white Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians. And this was the cause for an 1819 book by John Fannin Watson called The Methodist Era, where he chastises them for singing like those songs that were first composed in the colored community, he calls it. Not only were they frightened because it was new, they were frightened because it was different, and they were slightly angry because something that was so um, important to them, something that was so uh, necessary to their own expression had been come from had come from a group that really oughtn't to have had the sense to create this and to bring it. Many of the slaves. A question of origins. The subject of slave religious music has produced a large and varied literature, the bulk of which has focused upon matters of structure and origin. This latter question especially has given rise to a long and heated debate. The earliest collectors and students of slave music were impressed by how different that music was from anything familiar to them. Following a visit to the Sea Islands in 1862, Lucy McKim sounded a note which generations of folklorists were to echo when she despaired of being able to express the entire character of these Negro ballads by mere musical notes and signs. The odd turns made in the throat, and that curious rhythmic effect produced by single voices chiming in at different irregular intervals, seem almost as impossible to place on score as the singing of birds or the tones of an Aeolian harp. Slave Songs contains 136 melodies with texts arranged geographically. Four regions of the South were canvassed, southeastern slave states, including South Carolina, Georgia, and the Sea Islands, northern seaboard slave states, including Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, inland slave states, including Tennessee, Arkansas, and the Mississippi River, and the Gulf states, including Florida and Louisiana. Miscellaneous. Each song's transcriber is named in the index, and so is the location where it was collected. Facing up to the difficulty of transcribing the music, the introduction admits that the published melodies will convey but a faint shadow of the original. Allen explained, The voices of the colored people have a peculiar quality that nothing can imitate, and the intonations and delicate variations of even one singer, let alone several, cannot be reproduced on paper. Moreover, although sung by many singers, the spirituals were published as unharmonized melodies not because the freedmen sang in unison but because their singing was too complicated for musical notation to capture. There is no singing in parts, as we understand it, Allen wrote, and yet no two appear to be singing the same thing. Quote, a later compiler of spirituals complained of a similar problem. Tones are frequently employed which we have no musical character to represent. Such, for example, is that which I have indicated as nearly as possible by the flat seventh. The singing style of the slaves, which was influenced by their African heritage, was characterized by a strong emphasis on call and response, polyrhythms, syncopation, ornamentation, slides from one note to another, and repetition. Other stylistic features included body movement, hand clapping, foot tapping, and heterophony. This African style of song performance could not be reduced to musical notations which explains why printed versions do not capture the peculiar flavor of the slave songs, which were consistently labeled wild, strangely fascinating, of peculiar quality, and barbaric by white observers. Another of its editors, William Allen, likewise wrote, What makes it all the harder to unravel a thread of melody out of this strange network is that, like birds, they seem not infrequently to strike sounds that cannot be precisely represented by the gamut, and abound in slides from one note to another in turns and cadences not in articulated notes. 
There are also apparent irregularities in the time, which it is no less difficult to express accurately. Henry G. Spalding wrote in 1863, the most striking of their barbaric airs it would be impossible to write out. The compilers of the Hampton Spirituals, M.F. Armstrong and Helen W. Ludlow, wrote similarly a decade later. Tones are frequently employed which we have no musical characters to represent. The tones are variable in pitch, ranging through an entire octave on different occasions, according to the inspiration of the singer. One could go on and on with similar statements. Western musical notation's inability to capture the tonal and rhythmic mobility and variability such quotes remark upon confirms the fugitive spirit Hurston identifies with High John to Conquer. It is no accident that High John to Conquer has evaded the ears of white people. She writes, punning on while poking fun at the use of accidentals by Garrison, Smith, and others to approximate the flatted or bent notes of the African American's altered scale. They were the early pioneers of the blues. Listen to this song by Blind Lemon Jefferson, one of the founders of the blues, in a 1926 recording of Long Lonesome Blues. I know the recording's old and scratchy, but something very significant is happening in that singing. Blind Lemon Jefferson is making some of the notes bend downwards slightly. He's flattening them. These are some of the earliest preserved examples of a phenomenon known as blue notes. Without the blue notes, his first phrase would sound like this. I walked from Dallas, I walked to Wichita Falls. But he sings, I walked to Wichita Falls. He doesn't bend down all the notes, just the ones on the syllables walked and Wichita. Here he is again, and listen out for the way the notes seem to sag down on those two words. Why are these notes bent downwards and not the rest? Indeed, why do it at all? The blues developed in rural America, but their melodic patterns had African roots. In particular, it's the use of blue notes which fall outside the Western melodic ladder. The resolution to this apparent dichotomy in the perception of spirituals in a major or minor key is found in the African survivor known as the famed blue. Certain tones in the major and pentatonic scale flattened or bent to a lower pitch. Using the transcriptions of the spirituals and slave songs of the United States, Southern says that the seventh tone of the scale is flatted indicating that the tone was sung lower than normally. The legendary blues artist W. C. Handy described the curious, groping tonality of the blue note as a scooping, swooping, slurring tone, and identified it as one of the markers indicating the African origins of the practice, whether it was used by African Americans in spirituals or the blues. Heard. He's altering the rhythms, he's playing blues on it, he's bending notes. He's playing the harmony impeccably. Every time one chord goes to another chord, he understands how the progression is working. Stop it, stop it! That note isn't even in the diatonic scale. Diatonic? Did I do something wrong? Something extraordinary. You're playing notes between flat and natural. It's like discovering uh, secret scales just made for this type of music. How on the G, what the gentleman says. Everybody in the white man.
Here's one. The musical scale given to us by Western tradition is inadequate to accurately render a spiritual. As in the modern day descendant, jazz, or blues, the spiritual frequently employs the blue note. Most commonly, the blue note refers to the flatted third or seventh step of the Western seven note scale. However, the real or historic blue note falls between the gaps of the accepted Western scale. It is only in the gaps that the mournful, soulful, and truly blue note sounds. It must be remembered that spirituals were sung accompanied only by hand claps, moans, stomps, or dancing. Thus, there were no fixed scale instruments to imprison the tone. In here's one we hear an example of the soulful blue note in this case, the flatted third scale step. One further step on the map. You've probably heard about blue notes, right? Yes. Aren't they like notes like the minor third? the diminished fifth or the minor seventh, played within a major context? Yeah, kind of. A typical explanation lies within the minor pentatonic, which is common in Western African music. Usually Western theorists say pentatonic music is simply based on fifths, but it's a little more complex than that. Blues performers actually bend the pitch to reach notes off the 12 tet grid. It is neither a major third nor a minor third. It can be everything in between. Ah, I think I get it. It's not a fixed scale. A blue note can be a lot of different things, depending on its context, and of course, personal preference. Exactly. And now take There does, however, seem to be some agreement on the nature of spirituals when the focus is instead on the rhythm or beat of the music when compared to other forms of folk music. The spirituals show a preference for simple duple meters, with the time kept by the padding of a hand or a tapping of a foot. That pronounced beat is one of the seven basic characteristics of a true spiritual, according to Wyatt T. Walker. 1. Deep Biblicism. 2. Eternity of Message. 3. Rhythmic. Four given to improvisation. 5. Antiphonal or call and response. 6. Double or coded meaning. 7. Repetitive. 8. Unique imagery. Oh, you better run, better run, better run. Ah, you better run. Oh, you better run to the city hall. Yeah. You better run. 
Did you read about Samson there? From his birth, he was the strongest man that ever lived on earth. The one day Samson was walking along, oh well, Samson struck her was never found out. And the guy came and sat on his knees and the Tell me where your strength might be uh, He told him a strength I in my hand You just shake my head Just as I clean as my hand uh, My strength will become As a natural man uh, But uh, you better run, 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 run. Uh, You better run, 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 run. Yeah, you better They were secret songs, 
songs of sorrow and redemption. These former slaves would sing them to worldwide acclaim on an impossible journey where they would sacrifice everything. Jubilee Singers, Sacrifice and Glory, tonight on The American Experience. The American... The folk spiritual, created as an expression of African-American culture and religion, was now transferred to the concert stage, both in the USA and beyond. While the repertoire of these new arrangements was identical to that of the folk spiritual, this change in function was accompanied by a change in performance practice. The hand clapping, foot stomping and individual latitude in interpreting the melodic line that had characterized the folk spiritual were replaced by a degree of formality and reserve that distanced this new version from its predecessor. Experience, I'm David McCullough. Courage is a powerful old theme in the story of America. The courage to cross great oceans for the chance of a better life. The courage to defy tyranny. The courage to stand up for one's convictions. Our film is about nine very courageous and gifted young Americans who in 1871, six years after the Civil War, set off from Nashville, Tennessee, not to cross the Rockies or sail round the Horn, but to save a failing university that meant everything to them. They were the Jubilee Singers from Fisk University, heading north on a first tour. All but two were former slaves. Several were still in their teens. They had no money, no reputation, no experience performing on the road. And the ridicule and menace they faced, because of their color, were all too real in a land where by then everybody supposedly had equal rights. Their strength was in their faith, faith in God, faith in education, and faith in the transcendent spirit in the old songs they sang, cabin songs from slave times. Swing low, sweet chariot, steal away. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The Jubilee singers were the first to perform these songs before white audiences. It was music to touch the hearts and souls of men and women everywhere. And there would come the moment at historic Plymouth Church in Brooklyn when suddenly the power of their message became evident as never before. Jubilee Singers, Sacrifice and Glory by producer. The African-American spiritual, musical characteristics of unaccompanied, choral arrangements, comparison of spirituals and choral arrangements. From the time they were first performed by the Fisk Jubilee Singers, the choral arrangements of the spirituals have readily engaged the emotions of audiences in a remarkable way. Arrangers have been able to generate and encourage rapid emotional response in performers and listeners as well as vicarious listener participation. Such a reaction perpetuates the feelings of community and emotional expression that characterize African and African-American music. Earlier chapters delineated the characteristics of the original spirituals and listed the ensembles whose concert performances of the spirituals generated a need for concert arrangements. This chapter presents and compares the musical characteristics of the arrangements and the original songs to validate the arrangements as the first artistic descendant of the spirituals. It also gives the choral director or researcher the means for selecting and performing arrangements which continue and expand upon the traditions of fervor, structure, and performance practice begun by the slaves. Form. The call and response structure of African music has proved to be an important factor in choral arrangements of spirituals. In addition to governing sections, both the short phrase call with short response and the call with longer response can determine the structure of entire compositions. Ain't Got Time to Die by Hall Johnson is an original composition in the style of the choral arrangements of the spiritual and melody. Although the slaves continued the African tradition of using a multiplicity of melodic formulas, they favored the major and pentatonic scales. They often used the vocal devices of swooping, slurring, and gliding to and from notes to alter scale tones. When these altered tones became permanent replacements, most often in the major scale, new scales or modes were formed. The tendency to flat the third and seventh notes of the scale, for instance, 
is one such example. Sometimes the altered tones were used along with the existing scale tones, thereby increasing harmonic choices. In other cases, the melody was tonally ambivalent or, at least, deceptive. One such melody, Give Up the World, has been arranged by Lena McLean. In each verse of her strophic setting, McLean delayed ultimate resolution to D minor in the fourth and last phrase by harmonizing the first three phrases of the verse in F major. The African practice of smearing notes could have been a contributing factor in added note dissonant chords which, because they do not resolve, are non-functional in the tonal sense. The arrangers often used these and other non-functional dissonant chords, along with borrowed and altered chords, at the ends of compositions to build emotional intensity. Rhythm African dance steps, each peculiar to the hands, feet, or hips, were layered to create a multi-rhythmic texture. Choral arrangers arrived at a polyrhythmic texture via this tradition of additive rhythms polyrhythmic rather than polyphonic because of the emphasis on rhythmic instead of melodic independence. African dance and, later, the ring shout of the slaves, was characterized by a steady pulse which reflected the steps of the feet. This trait was translated into an unflagging pulse in choral arrangements of spirituals. The last section of Dawson's Ezekiel Saw the Wheel contains several rhythms that accentuate the unflagging pulse. The quarter notes on wheel in the second bass, the sixteenth dotted eighth rhythm, also known as a snap rhythm on wheel and in it. In the first bass, the eighth two sixteenths, eighth two sixteenths on wheel in a wheel in a in the second alto, and the do maluma on four sixteenth notes sung by alto, tenors, and baritones. Superimposed upon these riffs, repeated motive or phrase, which accentuate the pulse, is a riff in the first alto, 16th 16th tied to an 8th 2 16th, which is a variation of the first bass rhythm, 16th dotted 8th, 16th dotted 8th. The 16th note tied to the 8th in the first alto is rhythmically equivalent to the dotted 8th in the first bass rhythm. The two voices differ, however, because the alto motive is melodically inverted and enters a half beat later than does the first bass motive. When the Ezekiel melody is added by the divided sopranos and tenors, the result is a texture that reflects the combination of polyrhythm and unflagging pulse that is a powerful trait shared by African music, the original African-American spiritual and the spiritual arrangements. Rhythm, timbre, tone quality. An important timbral trait used in the arrangements is the hum. In some arrangements a humming chorus accompanies a solo voice, as in William Dawson's arrangement of There's a Bomb in Gilead. At other times, the chorus may hum both melody and harmony instead of singing the text as in Donald Moore's arrangement of Deep River, Moore 1988. The hum was one of the sounds which reflected exploration of vocal timbers by Africans and African-American slaves. Other African timbrel sounds include moans, cries, hollers, and groans. In the arrangements, through variation and improvisation, they became licks or obligatos as well as single notes or short passages in the vocal parts which filled in and enriched a chord. At M, in Ain't Got Time to Die, Hall Johnson added a two-part hummed obligato sung by two solo sopranos to a texture which includes a tenor lick and a chorus riff, each on different texts. Quite often the obligatos and chords lie high in the ranges of all singers, creating a special kind of tension and excitement in the sonority probably a timbre developed from the African tradition of singing falsetto. Dawson set the entire last phrase of Ezekiel saw the wheel very high, beginning with an IV chord built on the E-flat 1 and ending with a full tonic chord spanning two octaves from B-flat to B-flat 2. The African practice of incantation influenced both form and timbre. The responses in the call and response form emerged from the repetitious incantations found in African music. A less obvious characteristic which emerged via improvisation on the incantation is the changing of timbres with each repetition of the response. Two such timbral changes occur in Dawson's arrangement of Ezekiel Sada, edge of financial collapse. It was in this climate that George L. 
White, a musician and treasurer of a school, came up with the idea of forming a small touring choir of Fisk students who could raise money on concert tours to help with Fisk's serious financial problems. White received very little encouragement from his administrative and faculty colleagues at Fisk. Nevertheless, he was confident that his fundraising plan would succeed. White, impressed by the spontaneous singing of spirituals among Fisk students, many of whom had been slaves, believed that spirituals would provide unique concert material giving his group an edge over the offerings of competing choirs. However, the nine young women and men who constituted the first Fisk Touring Choir in 1871 resisted strongly the idea of singing their songs in public. One important reason was their belief, based on experiences with whites, that their music would be ridiculed and perceived as simple-minded or primitive. Some of the students also wanted to forget the songs reminding them of the horrors of slavery, all except one member of the group, Minnie Tate, had been born in slavery. Accordingly, Isaac Dickerson, Green Evans, Benjamin Holmes, Jenny Jackson, Maggie Porter, Thomas Rutling, Ella Shepard, Minnie Tate, and Eliza Walker began their tour in October 1871 with a concert program consisting of classical choral works and popular folk tunes. No spirituals were included. Although they sang beautifully, the entrenched racism of white audiences made it difficult for the singers to receive much support for their concerts. In the first few concerts, they were lucky if they raised as much as $50. Audiences frequently consisted of 20 or fewer people. Understandably, the young singers quickly became discouraged and disillusioned. To sing the money out of the hearts and pockets of the people. Ella Shepard. Right away him in the morning. White's plan was to lead his singers north to perform along the old Underground Railway, starting in Cincinnati and following the network of abolitionist homes and churches that had once relayed escaped slaves to Canada. For their repertoire, White chose European classical and popular songs, some composed by himself. At their debut in Cincinnati, the audience received them warmly enough, but donated less than $50. The next day, news reached the singers of the Great Fire in Chicago. They gave all their money to the relief fund and left town empty-handed. Night after night, it was the same story. Crowds loved their singing, but the collection plates said it all. Fifty or sixty dollars, barely enough to cover expenses. You are staying in flop houses or in boarding houses. You could get your meals there. The meals were nothing to write home about. Um, the rooms were generally dirty. Uh, they were not well kept. The uh, vaudevillians of this period referred to them as uh, don't look under the bedrooms. Um, there was probably bugs in the beds. There were probably rats around. There were always signs um, in the railroad stations saying, nigger, read, and run. And sometimes it'd be uh, below the sign, scratched on, and if you can't read, run anyways. But no one turned back. All we wanted, recalled soprano Maggie Porter, was for Fisk to stand. If the singers don't bring back some money, the school is going to fold. And so that the singers were having to sing at every opportunity. Sometimes they would sing in churches. They would sing for private parties. They would sing for teas. Sometimes they would ask them to stand on a, a busy thoroughfare. Many a time, our audiences in large halls were discouragingly slim. Our strength was failing under the ill treatment at hotels and on railroads, poorly attended concerts, and ridicule. Besides, we were too thinly clad for the increasing cold of a northern climate. Ella Shepard. The grueling logistics of the failing tour were George White's burden. Many times he would have to leave Ella Shepard with the students, with the rest of the singers, to get ready for the next concert while he went ahead to the next city. There he would have to secure a hall, talk with all of the ministers in the area to try to drum up support, build an audience, advertise, he would have to leave the students at the station because no hotel would take them in. 
and go up and down the streets knocking on doors to try to find Christian people who would house the singers overnight. It is true, we are not received like the Grand Duke Alexis, but we are willing to wait a little longer till the good time coming comes. I feel that our enterprise must be a success, for God is with us and has given us favor. Benjamin Holmes. Week after week, performing with little rest, White and the singers endured rheumatism, coughing fits, bronchitis. Their clothes ran to rags. Sickly Ella Shepard begged White to send her home, but White refused. He had begun to experiment with the singer's repertoire and now needed Shepard more than ever. Initially, they would have maybe 17 numbers that were, quote, white man's music, and they would include some spirituals, often as encores. But when they saw how those spirituals were received, they began to include more and more spirituals. They arranged them while they were on tour. And that responsibility fell to Ella Shepard. So here's Ella Shepard drilling the singers, arranging new melodies, teaching them, practicing the spirituals, all during the time that they're concertizing, night after night after night. It's incredible. The slave songs were associated with slavery and the dark past and represented the things to be forgotten. They were sacred to our parents. We did not dream of ever using them in public. It was only after many months that gradually our hearts were opened to the wonderful beauty and power of our songs. Unique contributions of the arrangements. The call and response practice is perhaps the most powerful characteristic in the spiritual, influencing both timbre and form. In addition to utilizing contrasting vocal timbres between the soloist and chorus and among various combinations of voices within the choral sonority, new kinds of interaction between soloist and chorus not previously exploited in Western unaccompanied choral art music emerge. The appearance of a seemingly improvised solo obligato against the chorus is one such example. The communal creation of the spiritual led to heterophonic texture in the folk genre and spawned polyrhythmic texture in the spiritual arrangements. The energy generated by the unflagging pulse along with the repetitive, independent, syncopated rhythms superimposed upon that pulse is an important trait of the spirituals, particularly those in the ring-shout tradition. The polyrhythmic concept introduced into art music at the turn of the 20th century was presaged by the additive rhythms already found in the spirituals by the end of the 17th century. Curtis and Cloud, 1991, summarized the roots of the spiritual in West Africa and its evolution in colonial America. They assert firmly not only the need for inclusion of the choral art arrangements of these spirituals in concerts and academic curricula, but also the need for accurate performance practice. Awareness of the characteristics discussed in this and previous chapters can provide performers and scholars with a factual and historical basis for choosing, studying, understanding, and performing arrangements in ways that reflect accurately the African and African-American traditions. These trailblazing musical and aesthetic contributions support its acceptance as an important part of choral music making today. Eventually, an event occurred in Oberlin, Ohio, that would have a profound impact on the survival and influence of African-American spirituals in the 20th century. At a religious conference in Oberlin, the Fisk singers waited in the back of the church hoping that an opening in the program would give him a chance to perform. Finally, when there was a brief lapse in the program, the Fisk singers, under direction from White, began singing. The historical record indicates that this was a major turning point in the tour. From this point on, the touring students began to earn significant money from their concerts. Writer Arna Bontop, 
in an attempt to sketch a picture of what it was actually like in Oberlin, described it this way. A whisper of strange harmony rose in the back of the auditorium. Members of the council in the front seats looked around in puzzlement. What was it? Where was it coming from? The tone increased in volume as the ministers listened, and their eyes showed that it was wonderful to hear. By the time it reached full voice, there was no longer any secret about its source. The weary and perplexed members of the council turned their heads in pleasant surprise. As they did so, Jenny Jackson raised her eyes to the ceiling and cried in an agony of deep melody. My Lord, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. It was a slow song with many lines repeated, and it faded as hauntingly as it had begun. But it left the audience in a bewildered attitude. Some mouths that had been opened to say, ah, couldn't seem to close. Heads that had turned to see the group of young people on the back seat remain turned after the song ended. History had now been made. The singers, encouraged by the positive audience response, sang on and on, one spiritual after another. Contrary to their apprehensions, there was no sign of ridicule. The extraordinary power of the music, much of which had not been heard before in a public arena, appeared to counteract the prevailing negative racial atmosphere. Momentarily forgetting that these were African American singers, Many of the listeners cried, obviously touched by the music. Although created by African Americans in slavery for exclusive use within the African community, these songs nonetheless touched something deep in the psyches of this predominantly non-African audience, providing one of the first affirmations of the archetypal and transforming power of the spirituals outside of the context of slavery. The experience at Oberlin marked a historic turning point for the students from Fisk. Eventually known as the Jubilee Singers, a name chosen by George White in honor of the spiritual, the Day of Jubilee. The students went on to complete their tour, no longer hesitant about performing spirituals in public. On the 16th of November, the weary singers arrived at Oberlin College in Ohio to sing before a national convention of influential ministers. This time, they reached past cantatas and ballads back to the secret music they'd sung behind closed doors, the sacred songs of their mothers and fathers. started singing Steal Away. And all of a sudden there was no talking. And then they said just you could hear soft weeping in the faces of the people read. And I'm sure that the Jubilee singers were joining them in tears because sometimes when you think about what you're singing, particularly if you believe it, you can't help but be moved. After their small triumph at Oberlin, word spread from congregation to congregation. Letters and telegrams flew ahead of them, urging other small-town churches to open their doors. Yet the singers still needed a name. After a night of prayer, George White had an inspiration. Children, he told the troop, it shall be Jubilee Singers. The name was taken from uh, chapter 25 of Leviticus from the Bible after the, the Jewish year of Jubilee. The Jewish year of Jubilee occurred every 50th year and in the year of Jubilee were provisions for uh, debt relief, provisions for redemption of property, and for emancipation of slavery. That winter 
White rushed to add more spirituals to the repertoire. Jenny Jackson brought him, I'll Hear the Trumpet Sound. Ella Shepard taught White her mother's favorite lullaby, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. When the Fisk students reached New York in December, it was make or break. Three days before Christmas, Henry Ward Beecher, the most famous preacher in America, had invited them to sing at his weekly prayer meeting. Beecher's Plymouth Church in Brooklyn included some of America's richest and most influential families. If the singers failed here, they wouldn't even have enough money to get back to Nashville. I shall never forget the rich tones of the young men and women as they mingled their voices in a melody so beautiful and touching. I scarcely knew whether I was in body or out of body. Gustavus Pike. Henry Ward Beecher was on his feet and with his hands in his pockets, he brought out five dollars and told everybody to follow suit. That was our start. Every church wanted the Jubilee singers to sing for them from that time on. Maggie Porter. Even the American Missionary Association dropped its opposition and scrambled to get on board. It would now take five of their agents, full time, to accomplish what White and Shepard had been doing on their own. Touring Connecticut, they brought in a phenomenal $1,200 a week. In New Haven and Hartford, hundreds of new fans were turned away. I don't know when anything has so moved me, wrote Mark Twain, as did the plaintive melodies of the Jubilee singers. In Washington, they delighted President Ulysses S. Grant and a concert hall filled with congressmen and diplomats. If the great book were destroyed today, wrote one reviewer, it could be recreated out of the fabric of these very songs. Success is now at hand. Our concerts are so well attended that many are doomed to stand and many more leave for want of room. In some cities, excursion trains are going to run to the places where we sing. The people seem to be perfectly frantic about the Jubilee singers. Ella Shepard. Now, when the Jubilees encountered Northern racism, protests often followed. When the singers were later refused accommodations on Pullman cars, George Pullman integrated the cars himself, and they stayed integrated for another quarter century. When a New Jersey hotel manager threw them out after realizing they were not blackface minstrels, leading citizens took them in, and an embarrassed Board of Education opened its schools to black children for the first time. These singers, wrote one newspaper, are doing a great work for humanity. They are, by their sweet songs, molding and manufacturing public sentiment. New life had come into our bodies. We sang as if inspired. We not only paid the debts at home, we carried home $20,000, with which was purchased the site of our new school. We returned to Fisk amid great rejoicing. Press clippings of that day are proofs of the type of program which the singers of Fisk gave. Writing of a concert held in Henry Ward Beecher's church in New York in January, 1872. Rev. Theodore L. Kyler of Brooklyn, in the New York Tribune quoted the Rev. Chalmers, a delegate of the Scotch Presbyterian General Assembly, is telling his home congregation that he had found the ideal church in America. It was made up of Methodist praying, Presbyterian preaching, and Southern Negro singing. The Rev. Mr. Kyler added that the wild melodies of the emancipated slaves that touched the fount of tears, as sung by the colored students of Nashville, would have strengthened such an opinion. Our people can now listen to the genuine soul music of the slave cabins before the Lord led his children out of the land of Egypt. During the time of the Civil War and immediately after the Civil War, most Americans had never heard black music. And when they did, they were stunned at how different and how effective and how powerful it was. And the Fist Jubilee Singers 
were responsible for creating much of that. The singers were forced to seek out new fields for harvest, thousands of miles from home. In April 1873, they set sail for the British Isles. Only one day after their London debut, the singers were astonished to find themselves performing before none other than Queen Victoria herself. The queen wore no crown, no robes of state, but it was the queen in flesh and blood. I saw her, I heard her deep, low voice saying, tell them we are delighted with their songs. I wondered why the queen did not speak these words to us. We were within hearing, Maggie Porter. They are real Negroes, wrote the Queen in her journal that night, come from America and have been slaves. They sing extremely well together. The Queen's pleasure opened every door. Prime Minister Gladstone, the Prince of Wales, dukes, duchesses, and earls were transfixed by their songs and the singers were quickly embraced by evangelicals crusading to save British souls. At Reverend Charles Spurgeon's vast tabernacle, they sang to a congregation of 6,000. Across England, Scotland, and Ireland, they were a phenomenon. Books and newspapers chronicled their rise from slavery. At concert after concert, their portraits and songbooks sold out to British fans. Thomas Rutling and Isaac Dickerson left behind a string of broken hearts. These young people are perfect Victorians. They are dressed in Victorian elegance. They deport themselves in a very Victorian manner. Remember, the world was not accustomed to looking at black Victorians. This may be the inspiration as much as the songs and the music for Queen Victoria to allow her portrait painter to paint a beautiful Victorian portrait of these young Jubilee singers. After long tours of America and Britain, the Jubilees traveled to Switzerland and Holland to test the universality of their music. Arriving in Amsterdam in winter of 1877, the singers were mobbed by adoring fans. Our arrival created a greater sensation than a circus in the United States. We could not go walking or shopping on foot because crowds of children in wooden shoes surrounded us so closely that we could not get on. Ella Shepard. They performed for the Queen of the Netherlands and raised another $10,000. But the nonstop schedule was wearing out George White and the singers. The voice is the one thing that we can't camouflage. We can't put makeup on the voice and have it come out a different way. So if you have a cold, if you're tired, if you're hungry, all of these things uh, come out in the voice. So you have not only the physicality of singing and the, 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 tr the, the, uh, the problems of dealing with, with working on stage, but you have on top of all of that the whole issue of the pressure that these kids are under to prove a point. The point is that African Americans are educable people, that they are people who can gain from a college education. Many people didn't believe that. That summer, White asked Cravath to come help manage the troupe. 
he got more than he bargained for. Cravath had no musical training, but he had big plans, starting with an ambitious tour of Germany, birthplace of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. White was against it. I know what is necessary to win musical success in Germany, White argued, but I see no chance at all to accomplish it. But in the end, Die Jubiläums Zange were a popular and critical sensation. What wealth of shading, what accuracy of declamation. Something may be learned from these Negro singers, if only we will consent to break through the fetters of custom. Die Berliner Musik Zeitung. Even when the Germans did not understand the words, they cried and smiled at the same places as English audiences had. At Potsdam, they sang for Kaiser Wilhelm I. As the Jubilee sang, Crown Princess Victoria, daughter of Queen Victoria of England, burst into tears. Afterward, she remarked, she hoped we did not think her silly, but she could not help weeping. She is in mourning for a child, and the song probably reminded her of the lost one. These songs, as you sing them, go to the heart, explained the crown prince. They go through and through one. In later years, many of the singers would remember these concerts as the crowning triumph of their careers. There was a fear that somehow to hold a fellow Christian in bondage was illegal. And a number of colonial legislatures very quickly passed legislation that said baptizing a slave does not change the slave's status. The Virginia Assembly in 1664 decreed that it was indeed possible for Africans to be both enslaved and Christians. So following that, there was a conversion of Africans to Christianity. This entailed religious instruction and instruction in religious music. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The congregation then would sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. The leader, praise him all Christians here below. The congregation, praise him. That's not what the black people did. As a matter of fact, they say that they don't lie in a hymn. They raise a hymn. Now we have black music has always been a means by which the early enslaved Africans came to understand themselves as a people that while they come from various areas on the continent, that they have in common this cultural technology of the ring shout. The ring shout. 
an African tradition that included elements of sacred dance and prayer to their own gods. They would take a gourd, a big pot, turn it upside down to muffle the sound, and then they would scream and holler their African chants and rhythms till they go into a frenzy and get the spirit. And then they would be all right for a little while. They had some release. They don't speak the same languages, but they have that ritual in common. Oftentimes, the, the slave owners would not allow this worship. You know, they were afraid of it. What are they trying to communicate? So there was a real push to Christianize the enslaved Africans. Slaves were allowed to attend the same church as slave owners, where they learned the hymns of the Church of England. The slaves were likely singing from one of the books of the Reverend Drive. Watts heard from Wesley's 1737 hymn book. The style of singing would have been lining out, a practice established in the United States in the 1640s. Adopted from the Church of England, this practice featured a song leader, presenter, minister, or church clerk singing or reciting each line of the hymn, immediately followed by the singing of the line by the congregation. Leader, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Congregation. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Leader, praise him all creatures here below. Congregation, praise him all creatures here below. Leader, praise him above ye heavenly host. Congregation, praise him above ye heavenly host. Leader, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Congregation, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Cultural adaptation allows the person of African ancestry to a new African-American self-definition. Dargan emphasizes the difference between African forms of worship such as the ring-shout circle dance and the lining out of psalms and hymns. The ring-shouts show adaptation of an African form in America. The lining out illustrates the assimilation of an English-oriented tradition into the sacred music and worship tradition of the African-Americans. Dargan states that a musical syncretism emerged. The English oral performance of lining out was acceptable while the ring shout was discouraged by clergy and slave owners. Lining out was a staple song feature of the Second Great Awakening used in religious meetings by Baptist ministers to enslaved African in 1800 to 1820. Watts' hymns were characteristically sung in the line style and blackened to the performance standard of black worship which includes improvisation and extemporaneous additions to the hymnal text. Among the slaves, lining out was called raising a hymn. The hymn would be raised by a minister, exhorter, in slave language, or a devout male member of the community, who would later be called a deacon in the Baptist church or a steward in the Methodist church. Instead of singing the lines of the hymns as they were written or reciting them in an oratorical manner, the leader would chant the lines, often chanting two lines at a time to a tune unrelated to the tune the congregation would sing. The congregation then sang the lines, decorating them with bends, slurs, slides, and held tones. The congregation would match or surpass the leader in ornamentation. Praise him. That's not what the black people did. As a matter of fact, they say that they don't lie in a hymn. They raise a hymn. Now, we have letters from the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel written in 1755 describing this. And what they actually did was a person who will later on becomes a deacon sings two lines uh, in a rather ornamented fashion and then the congregation brings in all of the curlicues and flowers that the Africans tend to decorate their songs with so that in a Watts hymn like Come Ye That Love the Lord the deacon would sing Come ye that love the Lord and let your joy be known then the congregation begins Come ye that 
said, love the Lord. Well, you're not going to get anything like that out of the Presbyterian Church. The slaves, when they were carried away from Africa, did not leave their religion or music behind. When you listen to the spirituals, when you listen very carefully, you can find rhythmic patterns that are very significant related to African music. When you listen to the harmonies, very simple harmonies, you'll find a lot of that in African music because most people in Africa do not know how to write music, but they can harmonize. The religious dance that characterized the shout was far removed from the style of music and worship that missionaries had taught the slaves. The significance of dance to this tradition points once again to the continuing impact of the African cultural past in shaping the religious identity of the slave community. In the minds of those engaged in the ritual behavior, their stylized movement was not to be confused with dance as expressed in secular contexts. Dancing in the usual way is regarded with great horror by the people of Port Royal, but they enter with infinite zest into movements of the shout. Despite references to the shout as barbaric, savage, heathenish, and other disparaging terms, slaves obstinately refused to abandon those musical practices that redefined Christianity in ways that were most meaningful to them. Other elements observers detailed concerning the shout include 1. A high degree of repetition. 2. The continuation of the songs for indefinite, yet often lengthy periods. 3. Variation of tempo in different contexts. 4. Robust, full-bodied vocal timbre. And 5. Highly embellished melodic lines. With an abundance of slides from one note to another in turns and cadences not in articulated notes. There was the white church that they went to and there was the invisible church that they snuck away to at night in what they called hush arbors, surrounded by trees away from the plantation owners. What becomes spirituals emerges out of the invisible institution. They also have the brilliance to encode the music with instructions in terms of how to flee. The prime example, down by the riverside, to signal that if you want to get away from the dogs, please go down by the riverside. Why? Because God will trouble the water. These biblical stories mixed together, spoken as a double entendre, in order to share freedom and liberation for people of African descent. We never took hold of the idea of being docile and listening to the enslaver. We always had a secret language that came through our music. After the Civil War, many African Americans chose to form their own churches. While spirituals remained the thread of black community,